It is the best-selling book in history. No volume ever written has been more loved and quoted. And its words, sometimes simple and sometimes mysterious, should always be studied carefully. It is the Bible, the Word of God. Welcome to Bible Answers Live, providing accurate and practical answers to all your Bible questions. Our phone lines are open. If you have a Bible-related question, give us a call now at 800-GOD-SAYS. That's 800-463-7297. Now, here's your host from Amazing Facts International, Pastor Doug Batchelor. Hello, friends. Would you like to hear an amazing fact? Since the inception of NASA, the United States has spent nearly $650 billion on our space program. Tragically, millions of those dollars were wasted because of little mistakes. On July 22nd, for example, 1962, Mariner 1 launched from Cape Canaveral. Its mission was to reach Venus and maintain contact with mission control for about 25,000 hours, which was 100 times longer than the previous Ranger probes to the moon. However, about five minutes into the mission, the command was given for the vehicle to self-destruct. The $18 million Atlas rocket had malfunctioned because of the single missing hyphen in a computer program. Yes, a missing dash ended up costing what would today be $183 million. Far more tragic, on January 28, 1986, the space shuttle Challenger exploded 73 seconds after liftoff, killing seven crew members and traumatizing the nation. The $3.2 billion shuttle and seven lives were lost because of a $2 O-ring seal that had not been tested. Neglecting little things can have catastrophic consequences. You know, Jesus made this clear that little things can make a big difference. He told us that uh, very hairs of our head are numbered. He said that uh, a sparrow does not fall without the notice of your heavenly Father. And he said that not even a jot or a tittle would pass from his word till all is fulfilled. Let me read that to you, friends. It's in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through 19. Do not think to say that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so, he will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And you can see here Jesus was making a case for not only the enduring nature of his law, but he said not even a jot or tittle, that would be the equivalent in English of saying the, the dot on an I or the crossing of a T, uh, something like a little hyphen or a dash in a programming code. It's very small. You wouldn't think it would make a big difference. But Jesus says, not a word is to fail. Heaven and earth will pass away first. Some people say that, you know, after Jesus came, that he did away with the law. Jesus said, whoever teaches others that even the least of these commandments has been done away, he will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Of course, Christ is talking about the Ten Commandments, the moral law, not the ceremonial or the sacrificial law. Many people are being taught error regarding to the importance and the permanence of God's law. And so we have a special offer we'd like to make available tonight. It's called the Written in Stone. If you'd like to better understand the eternal nature of God's law and how to separate the Ten Commandments from the other uh, you know, ceremonial laws or some of the um, uh, traditional laws, that'll be very clear. And it's important to understand that. Just ask for your free copy of Written in Stone. It's offer number 111, and you can call the free offer number 800-835-6747. Now, for any of our friends that uh, want to call in, we have lines open. The way to do that is just to call 800-GOD-SAYS. That's 800-463-7297. Nine, seven. I am Doug Batchelor. Pastor Jean Ross is out for the night, and with the help of the Lord and our friends in the studio, we're going to negotiate an hour of doing our best to answer your Bible questions from the Word of God. But as always, we begin with a word of prayer. Loving Lord, thank you 
again, for the gift that we have of your word, this love letter from heaven that communicates what is truth. And I pray you'll bless every aspect of this program that that truth that sets us free might be faithfully proclaimed. Please bless, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, if you want to call in with your question, it's 800-GOD-SAYS. That's 800-463-7297. And uh, keep a pencil handy because during the program, we often have free resources we make available depending on the various nature of the questions that come in. And we'll be sharing those with you as well. All right. I um, also want to welcome those who are not only watching on television. You know, if you don't know, friends, we're streaming live. You can go to the Amazing Facts YouTube channel if you want to see what's happening in the studio as well as listen. Or the Amazing Facts Facebook page, the Doug Batchelor Facebook page on AFTV and uh, others. And um, we're going to go to the phones now and talk to Jerry. Jerry, who is calling from Texas, uh, you're on the air, Jerry, with Bible Answers Live. Hey, Pastor, but uh, good evening to you. Good I've evening. got my question refers to uh, Matthew uh, 51 and it's verses, oh, I'm sorry, Matthew 27, verses 51 to 52. And this relates to the night, the last day of Christ on earth. A great earthquake happened and the curtain in the most holy place was torn asunder from top to bottom and many graves of the saints were opened. And upon his resurrection, these saints arose, showing Jesus had power over the grave. Now, there is uh, a Bible commenter that said that some of these people, I want to get your take on it, that were uh, from uh, pre, uh, after creation, pre-flood, and then, of course, post-flood, that they, that they may have been some of the characters that God chose to raise up as the first fruits of his rave wave sheet, you know? Uh -huh. And I just wanted to get your take on that, because it was powerful. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's just make it clear. We're talking, of course, about Matthew chapter 27, and this is saying when Jesus died on the cross, there was a great earthquake. Following the earthquake, uh, some of the tombs, and it's not a universal resurrection. It says around Jerusalem were opened. It says uh, because they end up going into the holy city. The, they don't rise from the dead right during the earthquake. It says after his resurrection, they went into the holy city. They, in other words, they waited until he rose, then they rose. They went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now, it, it's it's vague how many is many. Um you know, if five people are resurrected, we'd say that's many because it doesn't happen very often. It may have been 20, it may have been 40. We don't know. It wasn't a universal resurrection. Who were they? The Bible doesn't say. Um, but, uh, and, and you notice this is not mentioned by Mark, Luke, or John. So, but it is mentioned by Matthew, who, who did a very careful accounting, that there was a small group of saints when I say small group, there was many around Jerusalem, but small compared to the universal group that will be raised someday. And they were taken like a wave sheaf. Now, these are faithful that live probably in the proximity of Jerusalem. We can only speculate. You know, it may have been people like Isaiah that was killed in Jerusalem for his faith. We know it wasn't David because Peter tells us in Acts chapter 2, 40 days after the resurrection, he said, let me speak to you freely of the patriarch David, that he is dead and buried and his grave is with us and he is not ascended to heaven. So Peter is extremely clear that David was not in that number. But there was a special group that Jesus rose to take to heaven as sort of a, a first fruits trophy. And uh, don't know what their names were, but uh, it's going to be exciting to find out. Thank you, Jerry. Hope that helps a little bit. Talking next to... Anthony, calling from New York. Anthony, you're on the air with Bible Answers Live. Anthony, there you are. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes, uh, so uh, <laughs> I find that uh, sometimes I ask questions and then I listen to your sermon and you answer the question in one of your sermons. But um, I'll keep asking anyway. Okay. Um, um, my uh, question has to do with Revelation chapter 21, verse 22, and it says, and I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And so 
with the understanding of what it says in Hebrews chapter 1, I'm sorry, chapter 8, verses 1 through 5, where it talks about the pattern, the heavenly pattern Mm -hmm. that Moses was shown in the mountain, I I guess, you know, we understand that there's a heavenly sanctuary that there there was an earthly pattern of. Um, And so I guess I want to know is how is Jesus or, or, you know, God, God, the father and God, the son, the temple, um, in, in the New Jerusalem? Yeah, good question. Uh, let's talk about it. Uh, first of all, there is a temple in heaven. It's there right now. The Bible is very clear. The earthly temple was built and patterned after the heavenly temple. And Jesus ministers, the New Testament tells us, as our high priest in that temple. And uh, the temple of God, of course, is a dwelling place of God. Now, there's something different about the sanctuary now than there would be in the future. The earthly sanctuary was all about dealing with sin. It had, you know, the first thing you saw was an altar when you came in where the sacrifice was uh, killed, uh, bled, then burned, and then there was washing and blood was brought into the holy place. That was all part of the process of salvation and forgiveness. When we get to heaven, there's no longer a need for continuing forgiveness from sin. We're all purified from sin at that point. So why is it saying then that Jesus is the temple? Well, Jesus compares himself to the temple several times in his ministry, and the apostles do. Jesus said, destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will make one without hands. Uh, They accused him of that at his trial, and also he did say it in the Gospel of John. He said, I will raise it up in three days. And they said, this temple's taken 46 years to restore. You're going to raise it up in three days? He spoke of his body. And so we are called living stones. Christ is a cornerstone. We are called the body of Christ. And so I think it's telling us there in uh, Revelation chapter 21 that God is our dwelling place. And in that sense, Jesus is the temple. Jesus is not going to turn into an edifice in heaven, but it's one of the names for Christ. He is a temple. Uh, Thank you. I hope that makes sense, Anthony. By the way, we do have a lesson on the sanctuary will send you or anyone who wants to know more about it a free copy and it's called god drew the plan god drew the plan and just call the number 800-835-6747 and we'll share that with you all right we're talking to Brittany in california Brittany, you are on the air with bible answers live hey <laughs> thanks for calling and your question yeah my question is does First Kings have to do with our current government and how this world nowadays has become definitely a little more warped in their thinking and judgment? The, when you say First Kings, you mean the book of First Kings? Yeah. What? what cause First Kings is kind of all over the map with different kings and different situations. Was there a particular story? Uh, because you know we don't have a monarchy in well, America anyway. Things like, things like Ahab and Jezebel and ah, idolatry, or okay, one of that the helps. other evil yes, yes. kings. Yeah, thank you. That that makes more sense, Brittany. Now I think I know where you're uh, where you're coming from. Yeah, there was a time during the time of Elijah where uh, God's people had kind of drifted into great apostasy, and uh, you'll notice that the history of Israel is very similar to the history of the church. The history of Israel in the Old Testament, is, it's similar to what's happened to the history of the church in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the northern kingdom kind of went into apostasy and they got involved in idolatry. And the southern kingdom tried to remain true and stick to the word and maintain the ordinances of the Lord with the priests of the Lord. So you you had the one group that was compromised and... Um, that's what's happened to the church. You know, you've got a large Catholic Orthodox church that's gotten into idolatry. And uh, you might say 10 tribes are there. But then you have the Protestants that are trying to stick a little more to the fundamentals of the Bible. And so you'll actually see among spiritual Israel, some of the same history has been acted out. Unfortunately, in the Old Testament, there was a unity during the time of Ahab and Jehoshaphat. They started to join forces in a few battles, and it turned into a disaster. Revelation tells us that uh, these powers of Protestantism and Catholicism are going to unite with the beast power in persecuting God's people. And uh, so 
uh, are we seeing these days uh, lived out again? Uh, yes, in many ways. For anyone that wants to know more about this, you can look at our free lesson. We'll send it to you. It's called America in Prophecy. Once again, call that number, 800-835-6747, and ask for the free study guide on America in Prophecy. Thank you, Brittany. Going to go and talk to Debbie in Canada. Debbie, you're on the air with Bible Answers Live. Hi, Pastor Doug. How are you? Doing great. Thank you for calling. Okay, I have a question. In Genesis 1, it says, In the beginning, God made heaven and earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Does that mean there was water here? And how could that be if everything was void? Well, when it says void, the word void doesn't mean there's nothing. Void may means that things are in a a chaotic state. And okay. uh, there was probably vapor all over the planet, clouds, and it was uh, in this chaotic state. Because then what God does is he begins to separate the waters below from the waters okay. above. Kind of like when you got a foggy day and the fog lifts and you see clouds above and, and things clear up. Um so I, I believe there was water here. There was rock here. You know, uh, God came to this uh, mass and that was here in chaos. Everything was in confusion and he brought order to it. So okay. it's interesting, you know, just while you're thinking about it, where it says the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. You've got the Holy Spirit there talking about waters. You go to the last verses in the Bible and it says, and the spirit and the bride says, come. And whoever is a thirst, let him come and take the waters of life freely. So again, at the end of the Bible, yeah. you got the spirit and the waters again, which I always thought was intriguing. Wow. Yeah. Hey, thank you, Debbie. We appreciate your, your call and your question tonight. All right. We're going to talk next to um, Carlos calling from Florida. Carlos, you're on the air with Bible Answers Live. Good evening, Pastor Doug. Evening. How can we help tonight? So... The question is, uh, in the 2300-day prophecy of Daniel, uh, is there any way without going to an outside source to confirm the, the uh, starting date, the uh, 457 B.C. date, you know, the uh, command to rebuild Jerusalem? Yes. Well, the, the, and for our friends that are listening, Carlos is asking about one of the most important prophetic dates in the Bible, and, and it needs to be established because you've got two major prophecies that hinge on this. The prophecy in Daniel chapter 8, where it says 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. But Daniel faints before the angel can tell him when that prophecy begins. In Daniel 9, the angel Gabriel returns, and he says, I've come to give you understanding, meaning for the first prophecy, but he even expands it because Daniel was praying, when's the Messiah going to come? So then the angel gives Daniel what we call the 490-year prophecy, telling when the Messiah would be anointed, about this one week of ministry, how he would die in the midst of that seven-year period. And um, so both visions has one starting date, and the starting date given by the angel is from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. Now, there were three commandments that kind of came in stages. The last final permission was given by Artaxerxes, and it was in the year 457. You find this in uh, Ezra chapter 7, actually has the decree. So if you're wondering which decree it was, it would certainly be the one that uh, the prophet highlights, uh, the uh, Ezra, and he must have known what that all meant. And also, history supports that. Now, there are some historians that contend that, you know, they're kind of quibbling over six months. But, uh, it, you know, 457 is the uh, is the right date. I hope that helps. And, you know, you have to just research that. Go to Ezra 7 or look in Encyclopedia Britannica or some other historical resources and you'll find that. Thank you. All right. And we're going to talk with Junith, who's calling from Nevada. Junith, you're on the air with Bible Answers Live. Hello. Uh, blessed evening, Pastor Dog. Can you hear me loud and clear? I do. Okay, my dear Alan, I have a question on uh, the context of that archangel in First Thessalonians 4, verse 16. Okay. It says, uh, you're going to hear the shout of the Lord as he descends from the eastern skies. And uh, 
then you're gonna hear also the uh, what is it the sound of the archangel. Right. My question is, who's this archangel? Is this archangel Michael? Who well, is trying to portray only... Jesus, or are they both? You can see the the them this at the same time. Yes, the both that, that's a great angel. Ed. Yeah, uh -huh. that that's a good question because um, it kind of gives you the answer right there. The word archangel is only found twice in the Bible: once in the book of Jude, verse nine, and here in First uh, Thessalonians chapter four. It says, "The Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout." with the voice of the archangel, the Lord with the voice. And the word archangel means highest or chief. Angel means messenger. The Lord is coming with the voice of the greatest messenger. You know, there's a me there's a sermon that I preached, oh, maybe three weeks ago. If you go to the Doug Batchelor YouTubes or Facebook and you go back about three weeks, you'll see I just did a message on who is Michael the archangel. And if you take a look at that, Junith, I think you'll uh, be blessed by it. And there's a free book we'll be happy to send you. All you have to do is call and ask for it. Who is Michael the Archangel? goes along with the, the message. The message I go into a lot of depth, too. So hopefully that'll help a little bit. And let's see, looking at the clock. Yeah, we can take a couple more questions. Um, all right, talking to Brian. Brian is calling from Washington. You're on the air, Brian. Hello, Pastor Doug. Hi. Um, my question is, what was the first marriage in the Bible? The reason I ask that is, oh, I'm sorry. The reason I ask that is, how did we develop into the marriage ceremony and all the legalities and everything based if, if the two become one flesh? Good question. Uh, let me mm -hmm. see if I can do my best to answer that for you. The first marriage was performed by God. And as far as I know, the only marriage performed by God was Adam and Eve. Uh, God performed one funeral, too, and that was the funeral of Moses. It says God buried him, and God married Adam and Eve. Um, and, you know, you, when the earth was sparsely populated, uh, marriages were, you know, pretty small affairs, but it was always something that was done as a sacred commitment and a covenant because, you know, even at the beginning, God said a man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. This is a permanent covenant to establish this family unit with a mother and a father, which is God's ideal. And uh, as time went on, because, you know, sometimes people were making contracts with wives and and or someone might get married and not know that this person was married and they wanted everybody in the community to know these two have made a covenant. It was something to be celebrated. And it was also something to be advertised so that other men and women would know these individuals are off the market, so to speak. They've made a covenant and they're married. And, uh, and marriage doesn't have to be in a church to be legal. To be legal, it's a covenant performed before witnesses. Uh, for Christian, I don't know why you wouldn't want it to be done where it would also include a covenant done in the presence of God. And so that's why many Christians, they have their marriages in a church. It's a sacred ceremony. Um, but hopefully that helps. We do have a book that talks about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. But it, it does address the function of marriage. I always thought it was interesting when uh, a wife was chosen for Isaac it says, when Isaac saw Rebekah, it says he took her to his mother's tent and she became his wife. It's pretty, <laughs> there were nomads and I guess it was a pretty uh, private occasion. But you also notice Jacob, when he got married, it was a seven-day celebration. And so it, uh, and when Samson got married, again, a seven-day celebration. It was a much bigger event. Of course, Jesus' first miracle was at a wedding. All right, we're going to see here, talking to, um, oh, who's next here? All right, I'm going to talk to Anthony in Michigan. Let's see if we can address your question. Anthony, you're on the air with Bible Answers Live. Hi, Pastor Doug. Hi. Um, I was going through something in my mind lately where I was wondering, um, in, in different parts of the Bible, it gives different examples of like self defense and then like examples of self control of giving in to somebody striking you and then one responding and the decision to or not give in to that. Like Jesus 
when he was arrested, he didn't try to resist right. any of that. But, like, it's not like God didn't send David out to do some stuff, too. And there's, like, times where it seems okay and there's times where it seems not. And I'm wondering if there's, like, any resources or guides or verses or stories you might know that might give me a more clear understanding. Yeah. Well, you know, when when Jesus talked about uh, if someone strikes you on, you know, the right side, offer him the other also. He is talking about as a Christian in settling disputes. He wasn't talking about someone pulling a knife on you or attacking your family. You know, Christ also said in Mark 327, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he binds the strong man. In other words, if that strong man is not stopped he will stop the intruder. And Jesus said, uh, and then you got, again, Christ says in Luke eleven twenty one, when a strong man fully armed guards his own place, his goods are in peace. So it's a law of life that your persons and property can be protected. And, you know, if someone threatens your family with physical force and you're able to defend them, I think it's what you call a self-evident truth you should. Um, you know, you no know one, no Christian, anybody wants to ever resort to violence. But you got, of course, you know, God did use people in the Bible like David and Samson and others that, you know, he inspired with supernatural strength and skill to defend and even to deliver his people from their enemies. So uh, there's no moral dilemma in doing that. Uh, I think that, you know, Christians, if you're involved in a war, should do their best to find positions where they can... Um, be supportive in a humanita humanitarian way as opposed to taking human life. And uh, so I, as some of you have all heard the story of like Desmond Doss that uh, was uh, wanted to be a non-combatant in uh, World War II. He said, I'm, I'm going to be a conscientious supporter. And he said, I will support, but I'm not going to take up a gun. I'll try and heal and support my troops, uh, which he ended up getting the Medal of Honor for doing that. But uh, he said, I'm not going to take up a gun and try and take another life. So, uh, you know, he said, I'll let other people do that. I'm not going to do it. Good question. I hope that helps a little bit, Anthony. Don't have a resource particularly on that. I think I got a, I do have a, a sermon online called, Does God Believe in War? And that sort of answers some of those questions. You hear the music, friends. This just means we're getting ready to take a break. And we'll be coming back and taking more Bible questions in just a moment. So don't go away. We have some important announcements to share with you. Stay tuned. Bible Answers Live will return shortly. Would you like to start your day with an inspiring spiritual boost? You can get a daily devotional from your friends at Amazing Facts each day right to your inbox. These five-minute nuggets of faith provide an amazing fact that's tied to a deeper spiritual insight and it's designed to kickstart your day or to help you wind down before bedtime. Sign up by visiting amazingfacts.org, click on the Bible Study tab, and choose Daily Devotions. Have you ever wondered how to share Bible truth with your family, friends, neighbors, or coworkers in a powerful yet simple way? Now you can send Amazing Facts popular and attractive sharing magazines right to their door anonymously. These 12 colorful magazines present key Bible truths in an easy to understand way. To sign up someone you love for the one-year subscription, just call 800-538-7275 or visit afbookstore.com. Beasts, plagues, and the cryptic number 666. For many, the book of Revelation is both frightening and confusing. Does this last book of the Bible really provide insight for the final days? Or is it nothing more than an ominous book of doom and gloom? On the contrary, Revelation is, as the title suggests, a revealing, a powerful prophetic book filled with hope, encouragement, and yes, urgent messages of final warning for our world. Friends, please join me, Doug Batchelor, as Amazing Facts presents The Pinnacle of Prophecy, 
Unlocking Revelations Mysteries, starting October 27 at 7 p.m. Pacific Time. You can attend in person at the Granite Bay Hilltop Church, and you can view the programs on AFTV, Facebook, YouTube, and more. Yes, it's true, you can know the future. For more information and to register, visit PinnacleOfProphecy.com. You're listening to Bible Answers Live, where every question answered provides a clearer picture of God and His plan to save you. So what are you waiting for? Get practical answers about the good book for a better life today. If you have a question about the Bible or living the Christian life, call us now at 800-GOD-SAYS. That's 800-463-7297. Now, let's rejoin our hosts for more Bible Answers Live. Welcome back, listening friends, to Bible Answers Live. This is a live, international, interactive Bible study, and you're invited to call in with your Bible questions. We're also streaming on Facebook, on the Amazing Facts Facebook page, the Amazing Facts YouTube page, the Doug Batchelor Facebook and YouTube pages, as well as Amazing Facts Television and other outlets. And uh, before we go to the next questions, I just want to reiterate what you may have heard. It begins this Friday, a special new series, if you want to understand Bible prophecy, and it's called Pinnacle of Prophecy, the Pinnacle of Prophecy, and that series will start Friday. It's going to be broadcast live from the Granite Bay Hilltop Church. Uh, We're sitting in the studios downstairs about 100 yards away from that location. If you're in the Sacramento area, we invite you to come in person. Otherwise, go to the website and you can watch this online. And if you want to help your friends and family better understand the Word of God, invite them to come over Friday evening and to view the programs with you. You can download the lessons that we're going to use for free at the Pinnacle of Prophecy website. You'll see the address there on your screen if you're watching TV. That's pinnacleofprophecy.com. And don't miss this opportunity. 14 presentations to understand the book of Revelation, all springing from the Pinnacle of Prophecy, which is Revelation 14. All right, with that lengthy promo, we're going to get back to your questions. I am Doug Batchelor. Pastor Ross is out tonight. little secret. I think he's gone to welcome a brand new grandbaby, but don't tell him that I said so. So we congratulate him. And uh, our next question is coming from Glenn in Ohio. Glenn, you're on the air with Bible Good Answers evening, Live. Pastor. Hi. Good evening, Pastor Veteran. Thank you for taking my call. Thank you for your patience. You know, sir, during the turn, turn from the B.C. to A.D., the Romans persecuted the Jewish people terribly. Mm-hmm. Principally, I understand, because they wouldn't come into their religion. They, they really persecuted them terrible. But today, we find Jews going, join, uh, coming out of Judaism and going to Christianity by the fistful, as it were. Can that be considered as a victory for Rome? No, because uh, Christians, uh, Jews that become Christians, I'm one of them, Jews that become Christians are not, first of all, they're not becoming Roman Catholics, and they're not becoming worshipers of the emperor uh, the the roman emperor you know in the time of christ it was augustus caesar they claimed to be deity i think julius caesar was the first who did that they start claiming to be gods and the christians and the jews were offended by that uh, the romans had the heads of their uh, caesars on the coins remember jesus asked when he said uh, they were testing jesus and said should we pay taxes to the romans And Christ said, show me a coin whose inscription, whose image is there. They said, Caesar's. He said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Uh, Jew and Christians do not worship the Roman gods. And so when a Jew becomes a Christian, a Jew becoming a Christian is really becoming a fulfilled Jew because the ultimate fulfillment of the Jew was to proclaim the Messiah to the world. And they did that at Pentecost, and many of the Jews that were there believed, and the first early church was all Jewish, actually. The apostles were all Jewish. So uh, it's not a denial of Christianity or Judaism to become a Christian. I think it's a fulfillment. Great question, Glenn. Thank you. Hope that helps a little bit. All right, talking next to Linda. Linda's calling here in California, and you're on the air, Linda. Hi there. Hi. Uh, thank you. Um, this is about... Um 
it's Exodus 4.25 is where my question is. And before that, um, Moses is talking to the Lord. And then um, I don't understand what Zipporah meant, his wife, when she, uh, I'll read it from the authorized version. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at Moses' feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. I don't know what she what was going on there. Yeah, that is a good question, and we get that from time to time. Anyone reading through the Bible, they get that, and they go, What in the world is the backstory yeah, here? Yeah, never well, could understand. Yeah, you know, once let me give you the picture of what's going on. Uh, so Moses, he leaves Egypt. Moses is Jewish. Moses was mm-hmm. circumcised as a baby because his mother, they're supposed to circumcise at eight days. His mother kept him, what, till he was three months. So mm-hmm. when Moses was pulled from the river, even the Egyptian princess, you know, a little baby boy, they're naked. And she said, oh, it's a Hebrew child. You could see that. Mm-hmm. And they adopted him. And he always knew that. But when he ran away from Pharaoh and he went out into the wilderness, he married one of the daughters of Jethro, Zipporah. And Jethro, and they may not have been practicing circumcision, even, even though they mm-hmm. were related to Abraham. So when Moses has two sons, there mu- must have been some family dispute where Zipporah thought, that's a barbaric thing. I don't want you doing that to our boys. And Moses gave in to her. Now Moses is going to lead God's people out of Egypt. And circumcision is a covenant for Israel. And he hasn't practiced circumcision in his own family. And because his wife was resisting it. And God stopped him on the way and was going to kill him. Now, God, of course, doesn't swing and miss. It means that an angel withstood him like Balaam with a sword drawn. And God said, look, I've called you to lead my people and you're disobeying me in something that you know. You're the lead of the family. You should be taking care of this. Zipporah heard all that and, and with some regret, she, she circumcised the son and uh, cast the foreskin at his feet. She said, you're a bloody husband, meaning I think this is barbaric, but she did it. So that's probably what was happening, is Moses was in disobedience regarding circumcising oh. one or both of his sons. We don't know. Only one is mentioned here. Eventually, during the plagues, Moses sends the poor and the boys back to Midian uh, to where the father-in-law was, and he rejoins them in the wilderness later. But... Um, there was a family dispute, it seems, over circumcision. Okay, terrific. Thank that makes you very sense. Much. Yes. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Good question. All right, let's see here. Um, all right, let's see. We're talking next to Robert in Connecticut. Robert, you're on the air with Bible Answers Live. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, good evening, evening. Uh, Doug Bachelor. Yeah, hey, um, the Hebrews 10.26, could you help me understand that better? Because uh, I'm I'm looking at that, and it's pretty scary. Um, If if somebody has a a sin that they are trying to uh, get the victory over, yeah, you get the victory over versus, you know, willfully. I mean, somebody, somebody might know it's wrong, but they can't can't quite get it right yet are they are they uh, doomed or well let me read uh, this for our friends that are listening so they i know what you're talking about and you do uh but it says in hebrews 10 26 for if we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth there remains no longer a sacrifice for sins but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation that will devour the adversaries Anyone who rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much more severe punishment do you suppose he will be thought worthy who's trampled underfoot the Son of God and counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace? So Paul is saying that if a person uh, continues, and the word here, if, if we continue to sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, You know, the whole message of salvation is to turn from our sins, to be saved, not in our sins, but from our sins. Now, that doesn't mean you're not going to fall and have battles because everyone listening to my voice right now knows you do. But we cannot be content to continue to sin willfully. Willful sin is different than someone slipping up. Uh, When someone says, well, I'm just going to continue to sin, 
uh, and they're not fighting the temptation and doing all they can humanly do and trusting God's grace to ultimately give them the victory, well, they basically surrendered to the devil. Uh, a Christian should never be satisfied with known sin in their life. They should always be doing all they can to call on God's power to resist. The Bible says resist the devil and he'll free from you, flee from you. There's a struggle. Now, you know, the very fact the Bible says we strive, we wrestle, we fight, we war, we struggle against sin. These are terms the Bible uses. Every believer has this battle between the spirit and the flesh going on. Don't be discouraged, but don't ever come to the place. And many pastors are telling their people this lie. Don't ever come to the place where you're comfortable in willfully sinning. You see what I'm saying? Because if we say, oh, well, I guess we're all sinners and you, you make much. no effort to resist, then then you're basically surrendering to sin. And Jesus says, I'm more powerful than the devil. I can save you from your sins. So I know people who struggled with alcohol and were saved and they never drank again. I know people who struggle with smoking. I'm one of them. And God saved me from it. And I've never had another cigarette in 40 years. Whatever the addiction or the temptation is, God can save you from it. Now, it doesn't mean that you'll, there'll never be times in your life where you're you know, tempted and you fall in some area. But that should be the exception and not the rule for the Christian. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I appreciate that. It helps out. All right. Yeah. Don't give up. It's, uh, <laughs> Paul says, you know, we fight a good fight right to the end. Thanks so much. Appreciate your call. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Talking to Maureen in Brazil. And uh, you're on the air. And I hope I'm saying that right, Maureen. Yes. Good evening, Pastor. Evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my question, uh, it's more like a kind of, uh, I would like to under, understand more about Ezekiel 38. Uh, you know, I, I know that there's a lot of different visions on that chapter, but basically it says that, I don't know if it could be what's happening now in Israel, if it could be some kind of trigger to what's describing there. It says that some League of Nations in a distant future will invade Israel. And when that happens, uh, God will, will judge, will, will, will uh, perform some judgment there, if I understand it right. Uh, I just would like to, to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, they, if you look in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, it describes this massive battle when all of God's enemies, and it identifies them as Gog and Magog, talks about Rosh, Mishal, Tubal, uh, there are some pastors out there that are saying Rosh is Russia and Meshach is Moscow, and they're really stretching to, to say that. These are Old Testament. You find Gog and Magog mentioned in like Genesis 10. is going way back to the early divisions. This is even before the Tower of Babel. And, uh, you know, you can't associate that with, with Russia. But these were some of the tribes that ended up being enemies of God's people. And you've got Gog, and Magog means from the matrix or out of Gog, Gog and the children of Gog. Now, what you're seeing happening when this, these powers, the enemies of God's people, come upon them like a cloud is repeated. And if you take a look, Moran, in Revelation chapter 20, you will see there where, again, it says, at the end of the 1,000 years, there's this great resurrection all the dead come out of their graves. And it says, um, and I'm reading in verse 7, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and go out to deceive the nations that are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather, them. he's talking about Ezekiel 38 and 39, to gather them to battle. The number is as whom, like the sand of the sea. I think Ezekiel says they cover the earth like a cloud. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints. This is the new Jerusalem. Don't forget, this is not the old Jerusalem. This is the new Jerusalem. And fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. So who are Gog and Magog? Is this talking about Russia and China and these earthly nations coming against the Jews? No. These are symbols for the enemies of God in the last days. After the resurrection of the wicked, all the wicked who've ever lived come out of their graves. They are the enemies of God's people. 
they try to take, led by the devil, they try to take the Jerusalem by force. They are all judged in a white throne judgment and fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. This is not describing the events that are happening in the Middle East. Now, will there be a great conflict in the Middle East now? Uh, there may be. Can this be the beginning of the end? Yes, it could. Uh, you know, Jesus said, except the days be shortened, no flesh would be saved. I don't know. Uh, many times things like this have uh, unfolded into international conflicts. This has that potential. I mean, if, you know, if you've got an axis of Russia and Korea and Iran and uh, China, maybe, and they're pairing off against the Western nations, the United States and, you know, allies in Europe, uh, you could have just a, a massive global meltdown. And so we should be praying that the angels will continue to hold back the winds of strife so God can seal his servants and we can reach as many as possible. This is all the more reason people need to tune in to the prophecy seminar we're going to be having starting Friday night this week. Hopefully, Marin, this answers that a little bit. Uh, we do have a lesson called A Thousand Years of Peace. It's on the millennium, and it talks about Gog and Magog. We'll send you or anyone that wants a free copy of that. Uh, all you have to do is call 800-835-835. 6747. That's for our free offers, 800-835-6747. Uh, with that, we're going to try and take a couple more questions. All right, Joyce in Virginia. Joyce, you're on the air yes. with Bible Answers Live. Yes, I'm so glad. Thank you so much. I never, I'm never able to get through, but this particular one is, is uh, thank you, uh, J uh, the book of James uh -huh. and the uh, Number uh, uh, number one chapter and number two verse. Count it all joy. I've lost my page, but we go over it quite a bit. Let me see. Count it all joy when you're going through. And I don't fully get it because we have it all the time. And he said he wants us to get this. Well, but let me read this for our friends. Count it all joy when you're in the waiting. Do, does it mean that? Count it all joy while you're waiting and going through because when it ends or you're delivered, you're able to give God glory, on and praise, or tell the people about it. What does it mean when you say count it all joy? Doing yeah, that that good, that's a good question. You know, if you read on in the verse here, it says, My brethren, this is James 1 verse 2, and I'll read verse 3. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work. You know, when we go through various trials, uh, we know that if God loves us, it says that every father chastens the children that he loves. Every trial that you go through as a Christian, don't forget this, friends, every trial you go through as a Christian, God is trying to use that trial to reach you. God is trying to use that trial to reach others through your witness, because Christians are the best witness in trial or both, usually both. You, God is wanting us to learn something through the trial. He's wanting us to be a witness during that time of trial. And so embrace it. Paul said, you know, I've got a thorn in my side and I prayed God would take it away. But he said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. So Paul said, I am going to glory in my tribulations in, in spite of that. And I know it's hard to do that. But, uh, you know, Jesus said, if you're being persecuted for righteousness, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. That's one trial we can rejoice in. And one time when the apostles were whipped for their faith by the Sanhedrin and said they left the place rejoicing that they could suffer for Christ's sake. So I think James is also talking about that when he says when you fall into various trials, he may be especially talking about if you're persecuted for your faith. Thank you, Joyce. I hope that helps a little bit. And uh, we're going to talk next to Chuck calling in California. Chuck, you're on the air with Bible Answers Live. Yes, Pastor Doug. I'm wondering if you can clear up uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.14, where it says that uh, those who are asleep in Jesus, mm -hmm. God will bring with him. Okay. So, yeah, and this is, let me read the verse before, too. It says, brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those who've fallen asleep. Of course, he's talking about those who have died. And then he says, lest you sorrow as others that have no hope. We have hope that the dead are going to live again. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so will, now he's talking about future tense, even so will God bring with him 
those who sleep in Jesus. They're asleep in Jesus now. How will they be with Jesus when he comes? Next verse, he explains it. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who are asleep. In other words, the one who are dead, they get raised first. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. When do the dead rise? When the Lord descends from heaven with a shout. Voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise. This is future. So when Christ comes and we're caught up to meet him, it says, then we who are alive, verse 17, and remain, will be caught up together with them in the clouds. They are with the Lord first. When we get there, they're with him because they've just been raised. But the dead in Christ rise first, then we join them. They are with Jesus when we join him. So hopefully, does that make sense, Chuck? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And for any of our friends that are listening, you know, a lot of folks are confused about the resurrection. Some folks believe that when you die, you go right to heaven before the resurrection or before the judgment. And they read the verses that say, absent from the body, present with the Lord, which is absolutely true. If you're a believer and you die, your next conscious thought is the presence of the Lord. But you don't have that conscious thought until the resurrection. For you, it seems like a moment, the twinkling of an eye. It's almost instant. So technically, uh, we live in time. The resurrection hasn't happened yet. No one's with the Lord yet until we are caught up to meet him at the second coming. We have a study on that, if anyone's interested. It's called, Are the Dead Really Dead? We'll send you a, and it gives you all the scriptures, free lesson. Ask for it. You'll be glad you did. 800-835-6747. 800-835-6747. All right. Uh, let's see. We're going to talk to Mary Ann, first-time caller from Florida. Mary Ann, you're on the air with Bible Answers Live. Hello, Pastor Doug. Greetings. You know what? I, I last saw you in Canada when there was a general conference. <laughs> oh, Toronto. That's been a few years. Yes. Okay. My question is... Um, Revelation chapter uh, 20 and 21. In 20 it says, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of the prison mm -hmm. and shall go out to deceive the nation. And then uh, 21 says, And I saw um, the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down. So here's my question. That's going to be the same going to be back on earth with Jesus. And um, there's going to be billions of people, the saved ones. So when, when, when the fire comes down and, and kill all these people, the unsaved, where are, the earth is still not, not quite ready yet. The earth is still filthy. Why would we come from heaven, a, a, a clean heaven, and come down to a filthy earth, and then the people are going to be burned? All right. I would think that, you know, the people, got, uh, the earth is going to be clean first, and then we come down after the thousand years. Well, that's a great question. Let me talk to you about that. So we read that, and you can read also in Zechariah chapter 14, that Christ will come down. Well, the new Jerusalem comes down. Christ first comes ahead of it. It probably hovers up in the heavens for a, a bit. His feet touch the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives splits. It causes a great earthquake and leaves a great plain. The great plain becomes the foundation spot for the New Jerusalem. Jesus' feet touching this planet that has, you know, all the wicked have been destroyed here. It's just ashes. Um, there's no dead bodies laying anywhere. The Bible tells us that all the wicked are dead and gone. The New Jerusalem settles down on the world in this valley that has been prepared and purified by the feet of Christ. Then he calls all of the dead back to life for judgment. And instead of coming out of the graves and repenting of their sins, they come out of the graves and attack the saints. Jesus is showing that they have not changed. They are still ready to follow the devil in this battle against uh, Gog and Magog. When Satan's chains are loose and he can tempt the wicked, uh, he just leads them out again to fight against God. God has no chance but to judge them, no choice but to judge them and consume them. And then God creates a new heavens and a new earth. We are inside the city. The walls are 214 cubits. We're protected. Uh, nothing's going to harm the saved. But outside, the Bible says, are the, the, the dogs and the liars and uh, the whoremongers and all the wicked are outside the city. I hope that helps a little bit, Mary Ann. You know, we've got about a minute. Let me see. Um, oh, we're looking for a question that might be a quickie here. Uh-huh. Uh That's a long one. Let's see. 
All right, Scott in Kentucky. Scott, you on the air? You think you can ask a quick question? Here, listening to you. Yeah, I've yes, just got sixty seconds here. Okay, my question is: When Jesus died and rose again, he appeared to his disciples and other people. Yeah. And my question was: Did his disciples ever believe that they would be able to reappear to uh, their friends or family once they died? You know, there's a good question. There's no evidence that the apostles thought that they would reappear. And there's no example in the New Testament of anybody dead coming back. The Bible says that the, uh, uh, the living know they'll die, but the dead know not anything. So we shouldn't be trying to communicate with the dead. Uh, in the Old Testament, Moses said that anyone tries to communicate with the dead or to consult a medium, that was a sin. And it got into spiritualism and witchcraft. King Saul went to a witch and she supposedly conjured up Samuel the prophet, but we read later in the Bible that was actually an evil spirit. So that's one of the things that's going to happen in the last days. It says that these unclean frogs, uh, they're going to go out of the mouth of the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet to the kings of the earth and deceive them with miracles. And so there'll be spiritualism and deception just like there was in the days of Saul. Hey, thank you for your questions, friends. Now, we sort of sign off on Bible Answers Live in two phases. That's because the clocks that are used by satellite radio are a little different than the clocks used by the land-based stations. So for our friends listening on satellite, God bless. Tune in next week. For the rest of you, don't go anywhere because we're going to take in some questions real quick that you've emailed to us. And we'll tell you how any listener can email some questions. So we'll be back in just a moment. Thank you for listening to today's broadcast. We hope you understand your Bible even better than before. Bible Answers Live is produced by Amazing Facts International, a faith-based ministry located in Granite Bay, California. All right, friends, we'll begin with our first question. It comes from uh, Kel in Papua New Guinea. Now, greetings. I've been to uh, New Guinea a couple of times. How do I love God more? I want to love God more, but I don't know how or what to do. Can you help? Because I'm a bit confused on what I have to do to show that I love him more. Well, loving him more and showing him you love him more uh, are related, but they are also different. First of all, how do you love God more? Well, the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. So it's his love for us that touches our heart and makes us want to love him more. As we behold his love for us, it will increase our love for him. Not only will our love increase, but our faith increases by reading the word. Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So read the Bible, look at Jesus, look at the cross, and there you see his love for you. God so loved the world. And that's what leads us to repentance. It's the goodness of God and the love of God that leads us to repentance. So spend time in communion with God through prayer. If you know him better, you'll love him more and you will serve him better because you love him more. Love is a reason to keep the commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Moses said, I command you to love the Lord of God, your God, and keep his commandments. Okay, Martha from Zambia asks, was Moses part of the captives that ascended with Jesus at his resurrection? This is speaking of in Matthew chapter 27. And I would say there's no record that Moses was at that time. Evidently, Moses was raised by Michael the archangel. You can read this in the book of Jude, verse 9. And the devil didn't want to let Moses go, and there was an argument. And Michael says, the Lord rebuke thee. And uh, Michael resurrects Moses. Moses then appears in the New Testament to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses is there with Elijah. So before Christ died on the cross, Moses was already in heaven. He was probably not, or evidently not, in that group that was resurrected there uh, around the scenes of the crucifixion. And um, let me see here. Uh, is it necessary that a person is baptized and filled with the Spirit to enter God's kingdom? Yeah, the Bible says unless you're born of the water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. But there'll be people in heaven that were not baptized because they could not be, or it was before the age of John the Baptist baptism. All right, friends, we're out of time for everybody. Don't forget, 
Pinnacle of Prophecy. You can go to the website, pinnacleofprophecy.com. Join us this Friday night for that event and tell your friends. God bless. Bible Answers Live. Honest and accurate answers to your Bible questions. 